Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next session we have here talking about digital twins, you know, in, in association with and the evolution of where we're going with them today. Uh, joining us in this panel discussion, we've got some really great speakers joining us today. Uh, myself, uh, acting more as MC through here, trying to guide things as we're going along. Uh, Joe, I consider him the director of our building lifecycle solutions team, which really in short means I get to work with anybody and everybody that has something to do with buildings, whether it's design, engineering, construction, or facilities management through there. Um, been with the company for quite some time, but that doesn't really matter so much. What does matter are the people that are going to be with me here today that are going and, and speaking. Vince, if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, my name is Vince Danielli. I'm the construction team manager here at Imagine It. Uh, I've also been with the company for a while, um, almost 11 years. And um, in addition to being a construction team manager at Imagine It, I'm also the technical lead and expert in on twin motion and everything related to um, the Unreal Engine and supporting the Epic Game software that we partnered up with. Awesome. And Marie. I am Marie Williams Bell. I am an applications expert with the Building Solutions Division. I am on the construction team under Vince. Um, I've been at Imagine It for just about two years now, and I basically work with anything and everything related to BIM and Revit or anything to do with that. So, Awesome. And Jim? Hi, I'm Jim Stromberger. I'm a solutions consultant here with Imagine It on the, the BSD team, um, AEC, um, but also work with the um, FM group and kind of liaison between the two different worlds there um and have all kinds of information about uh, digital twins and and facilities management and AEC buildings and construction and everything in between so cool <laughs> so thanks so the the idea that we had here of getting together and, and talking about the, the digital twins is well it's it's probably one of the biggest buzzwords that's going around in the industry right now. And there's been places, I know on LinkedIn, there's been a number of different discussion threads that I've seen of people trying to work through what is digital twin? Is it just BIM with another name? Is you know, Where are you taking it? What are you doing with it? What's it mean to you? And uh, generally speaking, and you could say this about any number of things, I would say maybe it's like the definition of BIM when it first came out of if you got 10 people in a room and asked, what's the definition of digital twin, you're going to get more than 10 different answers because everybody's got a different opinion of what it's all about. If you talk to one software vendor, you get something. If you talk to another software vendor, you get something else. If you talk to an architect, a contractor, a building owner, everybody's going to have something a little bit different. So I would say as a first step of what we're looking at for digital twins, I want to start with at least a maybe setting up some groundwork of what do we want to be thinking is a digital twin for the purpose of the discussion that we've got here. There's a couple bullet points that are sitting up on the screen now of one idea of what a digital twin is being it's, is it a 3D model? Yeah, I'd say part of that might be a little bit debatable. The idea of being a twin certainly indicates 3D, but does it always have to be 3D? It's like saying, is BIM 3D? There's some discussion we can have there. Uh, but it's it's a model of something that you're going to be updating regularly, whether it's live or nearly live, according to the reality of the world of the, the real physical thing. So if we're talking about it from the sake of a, a building, we'll have sensors in the building. So it'll tell you maybe what the, the temperature is in a particular room or occupancies of different places. But it's there's something feeding into that twin, the digital version of it that is reflecting the reality of the real world so that you can look at this, this virtual version of it and analyze it in different ways because you've got that, that virtual model that pretty darn closely matches the, the physical model. And there's a little bit of difference of how you might use it depending on if you're looking at things at a, at a city scale versus a building or a campus or even we'll say just a particular production or assembly line. But the idea behind it is we do have that as a virtual model, and we're working our way into making sure it's being fed, actively fed information from the real world. So it's it's a broad thing, and in, in places it might be really vaguely defined, but at least that gives us some room to talk. Now, before we go on and take um, any of the questions that we've got here, uh, maybe throw it out and saying, 
uh, kind of the first screen I see is Vince, so we'll go to him. Do you see anything that you would add into there, what you'd want to adjust to that definition based off your perspective of things? No, I really think, in my opinion, um, the difference between BIM and the information that we're putting into these 3D models and a digital twin is really that real-time aspect, You're making sure that um, something is feeding that information into a system and we're not just looking at a flat spreadsheet. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with everything on, on the uh, screen here. And I think that uh, the challenges, and we'll talk about that, are, are how, do we, how do we push that into real time in 3D models? Right. Well, this might be a bit of a foreshadowing, actually a little bit of foreshadowing for maybe question number one, but Jim, do you, knowing with the work that you do with building owners, um, we'll say with the work that we've done with building owners, myself included, the vast, vast majority of data that building owners have is 2D. So maybe a question for you is, could, in your opinion, a, a building owner be working in a digital twin with a 2D representation, a 2D model, if that's not a bad clash of terms? Yeah, no, certainly. I think that when you think of the idea of digital twin, 3D is what comes to mind. But um, if you look at even the, the term you know, BIM, building information modeling, that second uh, letter is information. Information isn't just 3D, it's it can come in, in any form, whether it's 2D or even in, in, in just text and, and table data form, um, three-dimensionally, certainly. So I think that, that uh, a digital twin can be represented by really anything that, that allows you to, to mimic a, a real environment so that you can understand what's going on. Okay. So getting back to that, and we'll, we'll get some questions going here and some, some feedback going to the idea of a little bit of a foreshadowing of where we're going. If we've got questions for the panel, the first one that I do want to offer back up to you, Jim, is you know, why do we want to care about digital twins? And then we'll work our way backwards across this. Maybe after Jim Marie, you give your two cents and then uh, over to, to Vince. Sure. So again, kind of going back to what I had just stated. I, and I think anything in life, the, the best way to make any decision is to have as much information about the topic, if you will, that, that you can possibly have. So um, something like a digital twin gives you sort of a, another layer of, of that information, another perspective, um, a way of looking at, at whatever the, the, the problem is or the you know, if you're trying to design a solution for something that's going to happen in the future, um, just having that that set of almost virtual type data allows you to make decisions with much uh, much less consequence, if you will. We can we can de deconstruct or or tear apart a building, um, and it's virtual, so we can put it back together, and it doesn't actually um, change anything in the real world. Or on the other side of that, if we have something that's taking place in the real world, we can we can look at that digital twin to understand um, and help us make the most informed decision is, that we can, the best decision in terms of maybe how do we approach something or if there's a, a an emergency incident taking place um, in a building, um, you know, what's the best way to approach the building or or come in from from different um, angles, whatever the case is. So it's just it's just a, a way of just providing information so that we can make extremely informed decisions. Marie, where would you I don't know, adjust or add to or disagree or whatever from what Jim no, said? I, mean, I, I completely agree with Jim. It's like the real benefit is actually just the ability to basically test or like in, investigate a decision more before you actually do it. Like, I mean, we've all Thought about it with like our houses like just the ability to know for sure the decision you're making is is the right choice just because of the ability to test it virtually digitally before you actually implement any of those changes not to mention the you know the ability to like track maintenance and uh like you know systems analysis or anything like that where you know you want to see like is this light bulb functioning as like effectively as i want it to well you know let's let's see and like is it doing what it's supposed to or not so i, I totally agree with jim and Vince? Yeah, I, I think that most of uh, what you guys are saying, I'll, I'll agree with. I think that what a digital twin to me, it serves as a, as a 
a great communicator, a great communication tool to see what's happening um, and to be able to learn from how certain conditions impact other conditions. And when we're looking at 2D information, although you know, absolutely it's great and we need to have that enriched data, we don't really get the full picture until we bring everything together in the environment that it exists in. So um, being able to visualize impact that uh, one set of information has on another set is something that you don't just get in in a spreadsheet or in a report. Um, and we can learn from how uh, certain objects affect other things and enhance the, uh, the environment and make things work better. So uh, I think the, the big part that we should really care about is uh, the idea of digital twin is thinking all of this work that we've all produced um, in construction and in design, bringing it all together in a real sense and then analyzing it, learning from mistakes that have been made and improving on those in the future. I guess from my side, the only thing that I'd add to or you know, adjust with whatever everything that's been there is just the idea that let's make sure that if we're talking about the digital twin versus BIM, is that we're tying it back to that live sensor feed data of information from the real world. Because if we're just analyzing, and then it could be theoretical anal analysis, you know, energy analysis, something for the building that doesn't yet exist. Whereas the digital twin, it's doing that analysis and reporting from things that already do exist in the real world. So we're getting that feed. Y'all mentioned it. We just want to kind of hammer on that one a little bit more. I guess that being said, when we're looking at it from a digital twin standpoint and knowing that it's it's you could oversimplify it in a major way oversimplify it and say digital twin is bim with sensors uh, kind of sort of in a way maybe it's again definitions come up we'll by the time what we're done here we'll have 10 definitions of digital twin in this presentation alone um jim question for you with the things that you have done with owners and working through that knowing that the owners of the people that own the building, so they're the one that are gonna be able to get that feed from reality in there. What's the reality that you're seeing about the creation and use of digital twins from that owner perspective? Well, I, I think that question's broken into two parts. The first part, you know, what is the reality of the creation of a digital twin? I think the reality is is probably been realized more than than we we recognize. Um, and the reality is we've been we've been creating digital twins for for years, um, decades. Um, maybe it's not been digital, but even at the end of, of a, let's say, a construction project when we were still drafting by hand, you know, just to create that as built set of drawings. That is by definition of what we talked about in some ways, a d digital twin. It's a it's a, a, a alternate version of of um, a realistic um, thing. So I think the reality of creating a digital twin is um, absolutely there. Now, certainly today we have much, much more sophisticated uh, methods of, of developing information. And, and certainly as, as Vince talked about earlier, um, that three-dimensional data for, for any number of uses is, is by far, I think, more um, uh, useful than, than just having that two-dimensional you know, or or data, um, but again, the reality of creating a digital twin is is 100% um, here. I mean, we have the ability to do it in any number of ways. As far as the use of it, I think that's where um, it's it's developed much much uh, more in in recent memory of of how do we use that digital twin. And again, going back to what you were talking about, Joe, with with some of the stuff I've done with, um, you know, on the the owner side of things and, and facility side of things, um, I guess one of the ways that that um, I've used it, and actually, Joe, if you want to share my screen, I'll, yeah. I'll talk about that a little bit. Conveniently enough, um, you know, one of the biggest uh, uh, ways that we we track information and data, and again, going back to something you alluded to or talked about, Joe, is is that sensor environment, and certainly we have. We have sensors and and uh, ways of of understanding data in any number of ways. Whether it's a you know we're, we're we understand the the heat of of a space or um, you know different alarms, different you know whatever the case is. We have sensors that we can we can track any 
any number or any quantity of, of data type of, of data and information. Um, one of the things we can do that we, we've um, used it for something like wayfinding. So again, we're, we're talking about something like like wayfinding. So this is a a building. This is actually one of our our office buildings where our corporate office building where um, we can we can apply a sensor to uh, uh, a piece of uh, uh, equipment, whether it be a uh, in a hospital, maybe it's a mobile cart for um, you know, equipment that moves around a hospital or something that's, it doesn't matter. I mean, anything that, that moves. So um, you can track where that object is. So not only are we tracking um, the digital twin environment of, of what a floor plan looks like, or even in just 2D, but we can, we can also then understand how to find something or where to get to something. So this is a, an example where, you know, this is a, a floor plan just a two-dimensional view that's in Revit. This is a 3D, 3D model, but we're going to take this from Revit and be able to take this out to something like Ben 360 Ops. And then inside of Ben 360 Ops, um, we can come in here and we can look at um, what that 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 mobile asset information is. So we can we can see on a map. Um, this is the the model that came from Revit. We've we've brought it into BEM 360 Ops. And so now we can see, you know, where information is, where where locations of, of certain things are. And we can track and understand where those mobile assets live. Um, wayfinding then is, is something that takes place when we start to look at the, um, uh, uh, specifically the Apple, uh, the Apple indoor mapping environment and um, working with IMDF. So, um, so in here we're gonna we're gonna come in and and actually walk through and and map out the the environment that you're in, so that we can then go in and and put those there's me <laughs> put those sensors that we talked about um, on equipment. So in this example we actually just to have fun kind of put it on a Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head. So we have these sensors now that inside of that that map that's in been through 60 ops, we can go in and we can see where this data and where this information lives. Um, we can see it in any number of ways. Um, so whether it's it's looking at it from a, a, a phone, an iPhone or a, a, a iPad or on your desktop. Um, again, there are any number of ways we can we can track this information. Um, with wayfinding, again, it's nice because with those sensors in place, you have something like your your iPhone, you're on site and you're you're standing here and it's gonna show you this is where you are, this is where the equipment is. And because we went through and we we walked the space after we brought it in here, um, you know, this is gonna show you similar to to uh, you know a maps uh application you might use, whether it's Apple Maps or or uh Google or uh whatever it is, it's gonna literally show you a path of how to get to that equipment of of where that object is. Um, so we're going to go from that Revit environment out to BIM 360 Ops. We're going to use those sensors and, and all this data, all these assets that are built into this Revit model. We're going to bring that into Ops. Um, and then we're going to use sensors that are applied to those objects um, and tell Ops that this sensor is applied to this object or this piece of equipment, whatever it is. And then inside that ops application, we can come in here and um, you know find that information or track it or be able to see even things like um, you know uh, different uh, tickets that we're gonna we're gonna uh, give to a command. So we can we can use this for asset management or whatever whatever the case is. But um, yeah. Okay. And in the same sense that this was looking at location from a sensor, the sensors could be occupancy, is the light on or off, temperature. Yeah, if a sensor yeah. can capture it, it's part of a digital twin, right? Or Absolutely. could it be part of it. Absolutely. Again, that's that's one example of what what that sensor environment can can provide. But yeah, we can we can look at it and say, oh, who left that light on? Or where is that? Or or you you may even have um a, a camera feed um right you know tied to some of this so 
when you look at this, any of these, um, uh, any of these assets, we can come in here and we can actually put links to a, a live camera feed or a point cloud. If we've gone in and, and done a, a, a laser scan of a point cloud, we can, we can have that link here in this asset to be able to, to look at what that, that environment looks like here. Um, gotcha. or a live video feed or whatever it is. So it's just okay. tying all that data together. But like you said, um, we can apply almost any data in um, in any of these, just based on what's gotcha. applicable. Okay. So it, it's to some extent when we're looking at the reality today, it's just all about the sensors and what can you feed into your model. Probably some extent after that is what do we need to do to allow the different systems to talk to each other? You were saying if we could have something just pull in as a link that's a hyperlink in a property data field, but then if we look at something like uh, Tandem, something like that from, from the Autodesk side, still in beta right now, but being able to create and configure data feeds to allow this piece of software to talk to that piece of software or data feed or personnel lists from PeopleSoft or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so if, if that's what we can see as a reality and the use of digital twins today, you know, people can and are doing that right now today. If we go to the next question, which is what's possible, what's coming down, what's maybe not everybody doing today. Uh, let me throw this one to Vince uh, with that type of piece of what do you see happening or being able to happen as we keep moving forward? Yeah, so um, it's great to start to think about the possibilities of of consuming different forms of data and visualizing this data. And some of it's some of it's right um, re readily accessible, um, but it takes a lot of work to get there at this moment. Um, and, and something I, I think going back to what Jim was showing about the sensor data and connecting it to systems where we can view it. Um, one huge thing in it that allows us to access this information sort of globally or view it in different ways is is cloud technology you know so um, Jim was using the example of of ops but there are all types of programs out there where we can create you know power bi dashboards or or different ways of consuming data and putting it into an interface where it gives us more information and I think what's on the horizon is being able to consume that data in real time in a either a cloud-based 3D solution or uh, even a mobile application and you know you can track different information um, in real time as you're moving through a city. I'll share a link here in the um, in the chat for for the webinar but there's a company um, called 51 World who actually did a recent study on uh, modeling up the entire city of Shanghai and creating a digital twin of that environment. Now, when you think of that from a macro sense, that's a huge uh, amount of geometry for any type of machine to process. But with the adoption and sort of the integration of uh, these really advanced gaming engines, and I'll use the Unreal Engine as an example because that's what we're familiar with here at Imagine It, um, these gaming engines have had the technology to process huge amounts of data and huge uh, geometric environments. And they have these tricks where I don't, everyone, maybe not everyone has played video games, but um, you can be in these extremely large environments, but it's only processing what is um, either in detail, what's directly around you, or as you're approaching things, it will it will sort of automatically recognize your movement through that environment and um, start to enhance the level of detail as you're approaching objects. So we're starting to see this integration into gaming engines, and then the gaming engine is used to create applications which are either desktop based or cloud based um, in order for us to consume that information and probably see more of the data in a 3D volumetric sense than we ever have been before or have been be able to have been able to before. Um, one of the uh, a, a great example um, of this is we've always had this ability to 
script data into these programs like 3ds max and maya and for those of you that are experienced with scripting uh, data in 3ds max that's just raw data it's a text format it's coding it's pushed into these programs and we can actually create uh, different 3d variations or update scenes based on these scripts well think of that in a real sense if we can derive data from sensors in real time and push that into either a cloud-based solution or some type of bridge into the 3d world uh, we're able to actively see things change in 3d as they're happening in the real the real world or the real environment um, and that's enabled through not only sensors like beacons like jim was saying with you know location and wayfinding but think of all of the uh the things that we carry, the wearables, you know, our, our phones. Um, you know, I think this will lead into uh, the next question that Joe's going to ask, but, um, you know, cameras on, you know, on the street or, or different just ways of tracking data through the internet of things or through sensor, if we can push that raw data into an interface that we can view, really we can do a whole lot with this um, some of it might be scary but some of it could definitely be extremely beneficial to um, finding maybe for example better better ways of designing buildings because of weather conditions and, and traffic patterns you know we move through the world in a different way than we did 10 or 20 years ago or 50 years ago so why not analyze that data and use that to design better environments or you know, in a, in, a, in a good way, you know, create better ecosystems or, or better environmental designs. Um, I think that's what's on the horizon. And again, with anything, this is just a way that we're receiving information and consuming it. But when we're starting to track all of these different things in real time, it's not theory anymore. It's, it's true. So um, I think that's where this idea of digital twin is, is really going. Well, then add in some AI in the perhaps as well. If we look at the, the picture here of, you know, onboarding and process or things like that, maybe that's the camera sensors that you're looking at that are noticing the types of activities to say, yeah, they're still loading luggage onto the, the plane and automatically sets that status instead of waiting for somebody to click a button on the phone to say, I'm done. So very cool stuff there. So I guess taking that specific type of thing and, and throwing it out there, if we say, this is what we can do today. Here's where things are going and, and maybe what we can do with a lot more effort, but we want to wait to do it until it's not a lot of effort. It's a medium or little amount of effort. What, Murray, from your side of things, do you see as being the, the barriers that are out there for pre preventing people from going this direction? Well, um, first and foremost, as I'm sure everyone watching has already guessed, the the number one barrier that I that I'm aware of right now is definitely going to be the cost of implementing a digital twin into your current facility. Uh, you're definitely going to have to buy, you know, equipment, hardware, sensors like we're talking about, and very likely you're going to have to, you know, train your existing personnel, potentially hire different personnel, um, all of that just so that you're able to get to the point of even being able to have a digital twin. Um, there's also, you know, a privacy kind of layer, like Vince is mentioning. Um, I don't know that I would love the idea of having my employer, no offense, Joe and Vince, but, you know, tracking me all the time everywhere I go for my phone. Um, so, you know, there's like a privacy factor, but there's also a security factor as well. You know, we work with a lot of customers who they can't use the cloud because they need security. They can't put anything into the cloud. It's pretty difficult to have a digital twin without some sort of internet connection. So, the, you know, the possibility of having your entire facility live fed to the Internet, um, even if it is in a secure location, is probably pretty risky for some customers. Um, and then finally, there's, you know, there's the concept of like how much work you have to put in up front um, only to have potentially later on a an update come like, you know, this the equipment that you buy is not going to be eternal. Um, there's going to be an update that you potentially will either have to switch out this hardware and go through that whole process again uh, there's there's a lot of factors that kind of become those barriers so, um, so barriers time, safety. security safety cost yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. um anybody else did 
Jim? Yeah, I was going to say, Joe, I, I would add to that. Um, I think the the idea of defining the the actual you know term phrase a digital twin is new enough too that I think one of the one of the biggest um, barriers is going to be just standardization. What what does that mean? What is defined by digital twin? I mean, we see that all the time in in the world of even just BIM on the owner side of things. Um, the problem is you have you have an owner that says, oh, I want BIM on this project. Well, what does that mean? You know, they they have the the idea that they want something, but they don't truly understand what that actually is and what it means. So I think one of the the other big barriers is just going to be standardization and and defining what is a digital twin and what does it mean and um, what are the standards we have um, around that and what what you know what information is required to go into it and for what purposes. Yeah. And I think, question for you. Oh, you first. And I, I feel like uh, as as we progress more towards digital twins, we're going to end up getting sort of like an LOD for digital twins, you know, like yeah. levels of digital twin that people are going to want to have to decide at the beginning of their project what they want to do with it. So, sorry, so LODT instead of LOTR, but we'll get there. Um, <laughs> I guess, sorry. Um, from your side, Marie, and some of the work that you've done with different uh, retail, commercial, and other clients, do you think are are you concerned personally about the the quality and accuracy of the models that feed into the digital twins? Do you think there's a lot of effort that would have to go into updating, we'll say Revit or CAD files or whatever? Yeah, I was I was thinking that too. So um, I guess I I kind of wonder like would that fall on like the front end design team, like the architects and engineers, or would there need to be a new model created um, like for specifically for the digital twin. Um, so the, I mean, the information that you're feeding into it, like at some point you have to have some sort of model, whether it's a point cloud, whether it's, you know, a Revit model, whatever it is. Uh, yeah, I, I do think that's gonna have a, a pretty big factor into the how quickly we actually make the transition into actually using digital twins. Yeah. Bring in the Joe, I think that's a, that's a really good, um, uh, Topic to bring up because when you do look at the idea of of models, um, you know we have on the design side, you know we build these models for the project. They're design models for for MEP, um, for structure, for architecture, for everything else. And then when you get to the to the um, construction side of things, even in pre-construction, um, a lot of designers don't realize that the contractors never actually use any of those models for pre-construction coordination. They're using fabrication models. They're using trade models of, um, you know, what's actually being built by the steel manufacturer and what's being being created or built by the, uh, um, you know, HVAC um, metal work um, contractor or, you know, sprinkler contractors. You know, they're putting their own models together that probably more represent what the, the the built environment would be. And then on the back end of it, um, we're trying to update design models and put it all together. So I I, I agree, I guess, overall with, with um, the concept of we're gonna have to define what models are the digital twin and, and how do you create that model? And I think that's probably, and Marie, you alluded to it, but that's probably where something like um, reality capture comes into play and, and point clouds and, and scan data where we go in after the fact and it doesn't matter what models were used to build and coordinate and construct and design, we're scanning and actually creating a, a three-dimensional image and, and model of what realistic conditions are. But okay. All that being said then, uh, no, we're kind of getting to the, the end of the time that we had here. We could keep on going on this for, for ages, <laughs> I'm sure. I guess, um, We'll go in the order that we did introductions. So Vince, then Marie, and then Jim. Any any final thoughts that you might have kind of summing up your part of the idea of this conversation? Uh, so yeah, I think I, I like what Jim just said about the reality capture because we think about updating as-built models or, or tracking you know, uh, uh, final models in the field, but it's still just a representation of that that design or that building at that time. So how we're actually uh, using, and it could be it could be scanners or it could be something as simple as um, cameras and photogrammetry that starts to create this 3D space. Um, so I think that's a really good point to uh, to think about. You know, 
there's going to be advancements in technology always. And how is the technology going to push us to this type of consumable data? And I think this is just naturally the next step in the way that we start to view the design world or the, the built world around us and analyze information. Um, and I think there are dangers in it and there's you know, privacy concerns and there will probably be some political implica implications that come from um, consuming digital twins or setting up digital twins. But from, I guess, from our perspective, we'll let other people uh, decide you know, the limitations on how we can, can use this. Um, but I, I think it's a pretty cool time with the way that technology is and, and the way that um, we can create these really robust models and, and collect information. Uh, and then I think just the risk is what, what are we actually going to do with that information? Are we going to use it for good or you know, not to be the uh, pessimist, but with, with the good always comes some, some bad. So controlling it. Sure. Great. Um, yeah, so I think um, overall, I think it is a good thing. I think that there are a lot of great benefits to digital twins. I mean, for instance, my my gym has an app that lets you know during COVID times just how many people are at the gym, like so you know when it like when it feels safe to go. Um, so we're already using things like that. I know people like to be able to you know in times of COVID feel safe. So that's a great like kind of use of like a little tiny piece of what a digital twin can do. Um, I think ultimately, like we as an industry are moving towards digital twins. I think especially for industries like you know healthcare or anything like you know dangerous like nuclear. Um, so ultimately, I think this is going to be a team effort for the entire industry. So I, I think this is a, a good step for us to be making in our industry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I I agree, and I think going back to kind of what I said earlier, I think we uh have we have an environment of digital twins in place now and, and have and i think now is a, a time that we're we're recognizing it and understanding how we're going to use it so i think it's really important that we again define those standards and define what are the uses and the standards are going to vary based on what we we determine this is the use of this digital twin for me and for this specific situation um, and I guess with that, to piggyback on what Vince said, I think it's it's important that we also recognize that it's not a static um, end. It's not the building's finished and these are the systems in place and we're going to put it here and we're done with it. It needs to be um, you know flexible. You need to be able to evolve that digital twin with the the real building or the the, the live piece that's that's in place so that it does you know grow together and match um each other so we can use that data effectively because if, if the digital twin is not accurate to um what it, the building is currently then it it loses a lot of its value so i think that we need to understand what that value is and we need to define again standards of how and why we're using things so that we can determine what what we are drawing value from um and then uh understand what we need to to what we need to do to maintain those objects so we can we can keep that value in place but it's the only thing that i'd add to everything else that you guys have said is uh maybe it's the the gray but uh no matter all the benefits that we get out of the digital twin don't forget that there's a human being on the other end of something that needs to take action based mm -hmm. off of what you found your sensor says that this is broken. Somebody's got to go fix it. So there's still that human element that we need to be aware of. We can make that human per, that, that that human element that much more better than where it is today, more effective, more efficient, more fill in your buzzword. But there's a, still a human element that that envelops all of this. So with that being said, I'll say thank you very much, everybody, for the time that you had here and for you know listening to us kind of spout off on everything we've got for digital twins. Uh, appreciate your time and. We'll open this up for questions and answers.